residential school survivor interview with William Lathlin. Mm. William G. Lathlin. Yeah, of course, there's our elder William Lathlin, William Shorty. Shorty. He gets my checks, I get his bills. Oh, <laughs> okay. So I have to use initials, eh? oh, Okay. His initials is J, William John. <laughs> okay. So, Mr. Lathlin, can you uh, maybe uh, start at the beginning? Uh, where are you, where were you born? I was born in, uh, uh, here in Nepal, and, uh, and I lived uh, most of my life across the river. And at that time, we got up on Indian land, and now we changed it to Pasquia. Basquiat, you know, that's what the uh, Canadian people called uh, the this place of Basquiat, so that's, that's why we reverted back to it. Okay. And, um, and uh, I was sent to a resident school in uh, Prince Albert, Saskatchewan in 1950. I was nine years old, I didn't speak a word of English, I, uh, and I didn't know uh, where I was going. I, my, my parents said, you, you have to go to this place. And, I go to school, so I went and went on a train and traveled all night and got to PA in the morning and, and sometime in the middle of the day that the following day, herded into a big truck in the back of the truck with a whole bunch of children, uh, some were old, were, some were younger than me, and, and then they drove us to this place where there was building, like, or like an H. I didn't know it was an army, an army barracks camp. Up on a hill in Prince Albert, Saskatchewan, but uh, there was an Anglican, there was an Anglican um, resident school. So anyway, they took us off and separated the, the age groups of the kids, the smaller ones and the intermediates and the seniors. So I was sorted into the middle middle one. So I uh, I was uh, nine years old, but my, my I didn't know my parents lied. But they said I was ten. <laughs> but if I was nine, then you would have put me in the smaller group. Okay. But uh, my uh, my uh, cousin said, no, no, don't don't say he's nine. Say he's ten, because you put in the other group where you'd be allowed to room. In a smaller group, they won't allow you to go anywhere. They'll keep you locked up. You know. So anyway, I went up there, and, and I remember uh, being led into a building where there was uh, rows and rows of beds, and uh, and I was assigned to a bed, and <coughs> and then. Uh, they, uh, they asked us to take our clothes off, and, uh, and then they herded us to a place there. This, there was water coming out of the wall that I've never seen. <laughs> I've never seen a, a washroom or a, a toilet or, or a water coming out of the, mm -hmm. there was a shower. Yeah? But a whole bunch of kids there. Before we went there, there was a, some person who had a, some kind of a powdery put it on our heads, and then we went and showered and got cleaned up. And, there was a little towel that you couldn't even dry yourself with a towel because you're soaking wet. So when you got to the, to the bed, our bed where we supposed to, all my clothes were gone, the ones that I came, came with. There was a new set of clothing there that I, I was told to put on. And then they um, stripped the bed. And then uh, one by one, the, you know, the layers, of, I don't know, the layers of sheets were on there. And then now he said, uh, you, you have to put that, put it back together. I said, well, I know. But I didn't understand English, eh? So I was watching the other people, and I was wondering, what, what are they saying to me? <laughs> what are they saying to me? So I watched the other kids, and I, and I, and I tried to copy them, eh? I don't know how many times I, I put everything together, and then he tore everything apart again. And then after watching the kids that were out there, paid all made up to me, and I don't know what it was, a 10, a 10 cent piece, they put it in a, and that, that piece of metal had to bounce off the, off the sheet, eh? So it took me a while to get used to that, and I don't know how many times I, I had to do it, but I learned. I learned that. But then the thing after that, you know, I, I, I only spoke my language, eh? And when we got together... Okay. Uh, sorry, I, I've got to cut you short. Okay. Continuation on interview September 30th with William J. Lathlin. G. G. Lathlin. George. George. Yeah, George. Now, Mr. Lathlin, before I had to stop the previous video, you were talking about uh, the making of the bed in the school and they were bouncing a dime off the, the bed sheets.
Yes. Can you continue on from that moment? Okay. And then uh, uh, after that, uh, going to the <coughs> going to the washroom and, and not understanding the, the English language. Uh, you know, the only language I understood was Cree. So, you know, and uh, going to the washroom and talking to kids over there, and we got caught uh, talking the language, and we were given um, a soup uh, called Lake Boy. Take a bite out of that. And I asked uh, the other people that sort of knew that, what what are you doing this? They got you gotta you gotta chew on it and so you know we had this uh, frost frost frosty thing coming out of our mouths because uh, and that soup didn't taste good. But I didn't understand that these people were trying to wipe away my language. So I would speak the English language. I didn't understand that at that time. Because <coughs> like I said, I've uh, been in the reservation to uh, with, uh, Nine years old and so on. I've never been out of the community. So, in this one. so that that went on. Uh, you know, every time I, we got caught, uh, I, had to, I had to take a bite, bite out of that soup. And I uh, kind of wonder why why are they doing this? Eh? And then the loneliness and uh, getting beat up by a group of uh, bullies that were there. Eh? So I sort of became a loner and I, you know in a crawl space in the building. I fit in there and I used to crawl in there and I used to take a, you know, like the boxes and I used to go inside there and make a bed to, to sleep there. But I, <coughs> I was lonely and didn't have no one to talk to. And I used to take my shoulders and I used to put it in my neck to help me sleep. I didn't know that I could uh, kill myself with that. I didn't know that. <laughs> you know, I had this, uh, it made me sleep uh, underneath the, uh, <clears throat> underneath the, the building, yeah? that was my, my uh, I guess, my safe place, yeah? and uh, that's how I survived in, uh, in the first year of uh, resident school. But the disconnection of family, I could never, you know, when you take a child away from the, the, the environment, it's like you're, you're destroying that, that uh, child, yeah? and uh, that's, that's, that's how I, uh, when I came back, I couldn't reconnect with my family. And, it, and the disconnect that, that I was there, I was so hard to try and fit into, fit into that, like I couldn't do it. And, I, uh, and I'm, you know, I haven't gone to school year after year for four years, I was in resident school. <clears throat> and it uh, sort of messed me up because uh, people said, that you're, you're, you're a little savage, we're going to civilize you. So I went to church uh, twice or uh, three times on Sunday. And the people that uh, told me that, you know, they, they told me that uh, about kindness and love and, you know, all the good things. Eh? But what they did, their actions didn't reflect that. You know, they sort of didn't look after me very well. And uh, <clears throat> one little blanket, thin little blanket in the winter time, And all we had was uh, steam heat, rod eaters and all that. In the winter time, it was very cold, you know. I had a hard time sleeping and shaking all night. And, and abuse, the abuse that uh, we got from other, the older kids. Eh? I was uh, sexually abused. Uh, I, I didn't know. I didn't know what happened. But they uh, tied me up to a bed and I couldn't move and I didn't know what, what they were doing to me. But I, I never been exposed to that kind of things, the sexual stuff. Eh? And they, uh, they damaged my my organ, and, uh, and that's why I, I suffered through that one. And I, uh, I didn't know it affected, it affected me. It affected my whole being, my mental, physical, spiritual, and emotional well-being at that time, you know, I didn't know. And then I came back in 1954, I, uh, I, was, uh, I didn't go back, I went to school and, uh, and in the community. Uh, and uh, my dad uh, became sick and I had to sort of help him. My mother raised the rest of the kids, so it was a constant uh, <laughs> relearning of things. But my grandmother had taught me uh, the language and, and, and uh, some good things about surviving, uh, preparing meat, hunting moose eggs, and all that other stuff, and the language. And we got for my language, I don't know where I'd be. It kept me in line, I, I retained my language. But having go through my teenage years and getting married, raising children and all that, I didn't know about anyone being a parent. 
but I wanted my children to have an academic education, which they all have, but I didn't know, I didn't teach them the good things about life, how to live and all that. And I'm glad uh, they turned out the way they, they did. You know, I, I didn't teach them a language, because I, I didn't want them to go through what I went through. I didn't want them, somebody giving them soup, when they were speaking the language, I didn't want them to go through that. I <coughs> I'm a grief. I, I didn't know who I was. I lost my identity, sort of thing, you know. So I had to, when, when I, um, when, and, and then I, you know, I tried to escape by drinking alcohol and doing all kinds of stuff to, to, um, to, to forget, because I didn't know what had happened, eh? I didn't know. It was only when people started talking about these things have an effect on you, you know, your mental well-being, your physical well-being, spiritual well-being, and emotional well-being. And I began to understand that. And the only way I could understand that was to go back to who I was in my language, to begin to relearn my identity. And from there, I started to pick up on trying to heal it. And, and um, the thing, the thing, uh, I lived in fear, I guess. Uh, the fear drove me to do many things. The academic education that I should have got, I never got it. I had to go, re go back to school on, on, on my own uh, to, to, to become a, a tradesman. Eh? I became a tradesman and I worked in the industry for many years. And again, I faced the same thing like being resident in the school. The racism being, an, uh, being uh, the only Aboriginal in, in the workplace. And I, it was hard on me and be pulling like this at work, not knowing what was happening. I take time off from work, but I knew that I had, I, I knew I, I had to earn money. So I, I just couldn't quit. I had to keep, keep at it. And finally, I got hurt, and then it ended up that I got fired uh, a few years later because I, I had been into therapy and trying to get well and trying to go back to work, and then I got fired. And, I just about killed me, I had a heart attack, but that, that's just what I lived for. That was my bread and butter, my, my tracer and my tracer, and I was murdering by trade. At the same time, I was working with the band as a counselor for all those years. I, I worked for a community and so on, building up the community, what you see over here. And in the same time, I uh, sort of uh, abandoned <coughs> my family, but I, I made sure they had food on the table and shelter and all that. But the living part, I never had a chance to teach them how to live. And that's and the language, yeah, that, that, that's the part that I regret. But after uh, going through all that, I began to, to see the, that I had, there was something the matter with me. And I started to figuring out what was what happened. And that's where I said, I found out that I, I had to forgive. I had to forgive what people did to me. I had to forgive them. Despite, you know, and then I had to forgive me. And then that's how I, my healing started to come out. I had to share my story with people. You know, at first it was hard, I cried and so on, but then now I have no problem telling my story. Because, like I said, I let it all out. And my teachings about your, your physical well being, mental well being, spiritual well being, and emotional well being. Those are the four areas that I had to, I had to figure out how to do them. And in my language, there's an 11 set, 11 set of uh, rules that I had to follow in each section. There's 44, which I don't know all of them, but I know that that's the way, that's the way I had to do it. So now I'm, like I said, I, I'm not, a, I'm not ashamed or afraid to tell my story. And my truth is my truth, nobody's truth, and that's the way I, I try and tell it. The way that I, I saw it, no, nobody else is, is my truth. You know, so, but like I said, I had to forgive me and to forgive others for what, what they, they did and what they're still doing today. Because all this stuff came from the government legislation. When the first prime minister said, kill the Indian and the child, it's still being carried out to legislation. In, you know, it's in the health system, it's in the justice system, in the healthcare system. It's on all institutions. Those words are hanging up in the air, and uh, the people that are working on that 24-7, because they, they're, their paychecks rely on that. that. That's what the apostles tell them. 
kill the Indian child. And you see that. I tell that to people, but they, they don't they don't they don't see it like that. But words are very powerful. Uh, when powerful people speak with words, the people underneath carry those, those, those words subconsciously. Oh, you know, oh, oh, I don't, I, I, don't, I, I have an idea how, how the universe works. Eh? Everything has a cycle. And for me, having said that, I'm not an academic education person. From my language and what I see, nature and universe, how everything evolves. Nothing dies. It, it, everything just changes, changes form. And that's, that's the way I, I see things today. So when you talk about healing, a lot of people don't understand that. Well, I'm not going to forget that guy. It's what he did to me. But that's not the issue. The issue is you. <laughs> You have to be willing to let that go because the Creator says, forgive, give, give me, give me whatever is bothering you and I'll take care of it. You know, I mean, this in Christianity and all that stuff, it says forgive them. So based on that, uh, we're, we're not different in our country. You have to follow, you have to follow where, where it happened in the physical world, in the spiritual world. <coughs> You know, the mental part or emotional part. And you have to take care of that. Those feelings and emotions that you feel in each area. You take care of that and then you give it to the creator and the creator will take care of it. Because in order for you to move forward, you can't. You're stuck. You're stuck. And you're, you know, you only have 100% energy. So if you carry carry all this trauma and you only have a little bit of energy here to go through your daily activities, how are you going to how are we going to survive during the day? So you run away. You, 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 you rather do drugs or alcohol or, or you, you know. Uh, I, I, became a, I became a violent a violent person because of the abuse that I got. Because at one time there was to be 10, 15 kids beating me up. And one day I said, that's it. You're not going to beat me up no more. Because I'm going to go after you one by one. And that's what I did. So we had a reputation that if you mess with me, it doesn't matter how big you are, you're going to get the same thing. So they avoided me. You know, and that's how I grew up as a teenager. But I had to take care of me first. But then, like I said, uh, the, the emotions and the feeling part and the spiritual part, I didn't know. I didn't know how to deal with it. <laughs> it was only later that I, after suffering, and, you know, mental, physical, and spiritual, emotional, that I begin to understand, you know, so I had to do something. And my journey began of healing. It didn't, it didn't happen overnight. It took many years, and I had a lot of help from different people. So I thank those people that were there for me when I needed help. So now I'm trying to give back, <laughs> give back what I learned from them. So that that's, that's my contribution to so this whole experience for me, it was it, there were lessons that I need to learn so that I can do what I'm doing today, and that's to tell people that there is there is hope for you. There's help. Stop destroying your life. Stop drinking. Stop doing alcohol. Stop abusing your children, your families, and all that. You know, stop hating people. Stop hating yourself. I, that's something to people today, because when you hate someone, all you're doing is hating yourself because you're only one. There's only one spirit, but billions of souls. Billions of souls, one power. Can I ask how many years you spent in residential school? Four years. Four? From yeah. what age to what age? Uh, I was uh, nine to 13. And uh, you mentioned that you're, you never taught uh, your children the, uh, the Korean language. Did any of them end up learning the Korean language? I uh, told them understand, but they don't speak. They won't understand the, the, the second one. Okay. The other three, and forget it. So, yeah. But, so a uh, little bit of words here and there, and yeah, yeah, yeah. But not they've lost the the, the actual language itself. Yep. Okay. Did uh, when did you go to school to be a millwright? I, I well, I had to, I had to go back to school and upgrade my education. I only had a grade seven academic education. Yeah. So I had to go back to school and upgrade my yeah. education to a grade ten level. 
I mean, I, uh, I work in different trades, a carpenter, a sheet metal, and yeah. all that stuff. I begin to understand that I have that to, because I, I was a copper and fisherman. Okay. How long did you serve as a council person? Uh, 13 consecutive terms. Did you, uh, 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 was that uh, part of the healing process, or? It was sort, sort of, a, you know, I wanted, I wanted to help the community. Okay. In, in, in that sense, but then... I wanted. I had nothing left. I wanted. To, I wanted to get out of politics. So, uh, and then they, they made me chief for two more years. Okay. <laughs> and that's when. That's when I, I was on my way to. My healing was so yeah. far in the beginning. Okay. But then, uh, you know, it, it took a. Few when more when years. did you serve as chief? Nineteen ninety seven to nineteen ninety nine. Okay. Ninety seven, ninety eight, ninety nine. Two okay. Years, two year term. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Lathlin. We're going to end this interview now. Okay.